Hello and welcome to episode 45 of Tabletop Game Talk, a show where we talk about tabletop games of all types. I'm one of your hosts, Josh. I am Chris. And I'm Kitty. Today we're talking about demoing games. We played a lot of demos last week at Origins. Today we'll talk about the pros and cons of demoing games and how we might adapt some of those ideas to teaching games at home. But first, a thank you to our Patreon friends of the show, Emil Jilljam, Shane Paul, George and Adam Harrison. Also, a huge thank you to all of our other patrons as well. Yep. Thank you, Josh. Uh, Welcome to our first-time listeners. Welcome back to the rest of our listeners. A few quick announcements. We did draw a winner last week at our Origins show. Mm. That's Justin Weber. Uh, Justin is the first person who heard his name on the podcast and emailed me before I emailed him. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, Justin. He's on it. Yeah. The game is in the mail. Hopefully, by the time you hear this, that will actually be a true thing. Um, <laughs> Doesn't sound very well. It's it's convincing. Sunday right now, so it's it's ready to be mailed. I just need to drop it uh, off. Okay, so it's okay. Okay. Uh, let's see. Our next giveaway is soon to be announced. Again, I'm looking for the right game to make it cool, but it'll happen in the next week or so. Then I'll decide what that one is. Um, and convention season is in full swing. I will actually be in Florida next week. I'm going for the Ooh. 4th of July week uh, for Dice Tower Con. I don't... There's absolutely no plan to do a live show there, but I'm not sure if we're going to do a recording while we're down there or not. You two are not coming with me. No. Nope. But that's okay. Next year, maybe. You guys really yeah. don't want to do all the conventions I do. No. Yeah, probably not all of them. But I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. Dice Tower, you guys get to do you like do did you hang out with Tom and the others last time you went? Oh yeah. Well Dice Tower, um, that one, there's a lot of people there to hang out with them. So right. it's not as much hands on. Right. Hands on. Hopefully it's not hands on at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's not as much like time to hang out with them. Right. Um the most time I spent with them was actually at a convention called Grand Con, uh-huh. which is in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Right. Um my hometown right. and that was a really small convention like 300 people and he and z garcia were there so sydney and i took him out to lunch and we like hung out and talked and stuff like that so that was a couple of years ago oh, nice. um this year we will go to grand con again and they're going to be there so oh, cool. kind of expect a similar thing um dice tower cruise which tom vassal's been pushing is a really good place too if you want to like play games with those guys because uh there's only a few hundred people that go and sydney's like well maybe we can stick it into the timeline and <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll go on a cruise for the wedding and then five weeks later go on another cruise for gaming yeah that's why, why i'm marrying her yeah <laughs> so but yeah so i'll be at dice tower con next week um this will be two episodes from now so we record before we leave to dice tower con and then we'll do a recording after that um and then game hole con that is well actually gen Ho- gen con first i was gonna say gen hole con gen con <laughs> <laughs> sounds great yeah so gen con first um just another reminder that the tickets are selling out for our live show which is going to be friday august 18th at 6 p.m um so if you're interested in making sure you have a seat there uh go get one now uh, also gen con is going to sell out this year the first time ever. Wow. So up until now, no the actual even, convention. Yeah, the convention itself. Yeah. yeah. Up until now, no one actually knew that Gen Con could sell out. And they just sent out an email saying that based on current sales that they expect to sell out. So if you want to go, log go to Gen Con That's now. Crazy. Buy your badge. Get it mailed to you. You do not want to sit or stand in the will call line. Um nope. because Gen Con's gonna be packed this year. Crazy. And then Game Hole Con, which is the one I'm looking forward to the most because we get our. I just got the confirmation that of all of our games are been accepted, so we have two dedicated tables for us. We have a table at the show, so that's going to be a lot of fun. And that's the first weekend of November in Madison, Wisconsin. So if you're in the area, um, I didn't have any Kickstarters that I backed last week. I made up for so it. So he went insane this week. I did. Wow. So the first one I saw was it's called Trip Lock. This looks fun. It is. This one's by Chip Theory Games. Uh, I've talked about Chip Theory Games because they did Too Many Bones. And there's a mini game in Too Many Bones where you're like picking the lock of a chest. Trip Lock is sort of that concept, but taken to a higher level. So it's still Chip Theory Games. You still have like the poker chips, the nice um, plastic sheets and uh, neoprene mats and stuff. Um, But it's really quite cheap. It's like $22 for the game. And it's getting 
pretty good buzz as well. It's the it's a one or two player puzzle game that plays in under twenty minutes. Um, Sounds right up my alley. Exactly. I'm very excited. So I'm looking forward to this one quite a bit, and the art is really cool. It has this kind of new Londony steampunkish art to it. Um, so really, really looking forward to that one. That one's Trip Lock by Chip Theory Games. Um, if you listen to our side chats and Kitty and Josh, I don't think you've listened to this one nope. um, because I I don't even think I told you I, I read did the this emails one. about it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I interviewed the creator of Gruff this weekend, um, and he Gruff is a dueling battle goats game. I like it. Like, listen to the to the interview if you want to get more information on it. But just real quick, the concept of this is you pick a shepherd, and there's a number of different shepherds that have you know life track and a simple ability. Um, then you pick three goats that go with that shepherd. Um, actually, three. You pick three goats to complement the shepherd. They don't. There's no requirements on the goats you pick. And then each goat, you have 15 different cards. And you pick eight of the cards from each of the goat things. So it's minor deck construction, but very guided, right? So you're going to pick three goats, and then you have a card pool. You'll pick eight cards from there. And then you just fight goats against each other. And goats drive the shepherds crazy, and crazy allows you to do cooler things with your goats. And it's a really (laughs) back and forth thing. The the art on this thing looks incredible, like really unique style. And I think you said like the creator's wife did all the art for it. In fact, the game was created because so his wife is a video game artist right. and she was just you know practicing you know doing different concept art and she decided to pick baby goats as a way of doing concept art so she drew all these crazy goats and she's like and he was like there has to be a game to go with this <laughs> and that's where gruff came out of um so then there was an expansion and now he has another kickstarter called gruff rage of trolls which adds co-op and single player nice. so you're fighting against the trolls um this is really quite cheap too for 25 bucks it's a standalone expansion with co-op and single player in there and you can also for another 25 dollars, you can get the second expansion and for 25 dollars, on top of that you can get the base game if you buy them all three if you buy all three it's for 75 dollars, uh, which is really a great deal for uh, the base game and two expansions it ends today it ends at midnight today so as you're listening to this podcast tuesday a june 27th i'm math in my head that's right kitty's looking at me hesitantly <laughs> you will trusting you. you will still be able to go on and back it also if you do miss this if you're listening to it later um he is going to have late backing so if it sounds something you're interested in um so that's gruff rage of trolls and then biologic we talked about biologic um this is a game that is done by one of our listeners um who sent it to me i've been kind of like you know playing the game, kind of giving them feedback in there on the rules and stuff like that. Um, so they kickstarted it two weeks ago, um, finally pulled the trigger on this one. So I'm now backing this one. The base game for this is $59. Um, and this is, if you have any interest in biology, I guess that's not the right term. It is themed as if you're a virus walking around inside of a body. Nice. So if that kind of thing is like... Say if you're interested by medical stuff or microbiology, fun... Yeah. Science things. Yep. And it's it's like that theme literally just kind of goes throughout the whole thing. It's a light area control um, battle. There's some tactical placements of as, you know, as you're drawing these tiles, you're going to place these different tiles to try to hurt your enemy. Well, hurt your enemy viruses. Um, slow them down so you can become the ultimate virus destroyer of the body. So... Uh, that one should be fun as well. And then, oh, this, I was going to say this is the last one, but it's not. <laughs> Rise of Tribes, described as lead your prehistoric tribe to victory through discovery, achievements, civilization, and overcoming the odds. Choose how you rise. So this is already at 200,000 of a 10K goal. Wow. Any game I see where they, you know, I, I, it's not like the multiple because you can say I'm backing for one thousands and you get ten thousands like ten times. But if I see something approach over one hundred fifty, two hundred thousand, it's like okay, I should probably put this on my radar. The base game's only thirty nine dollars, and the deluxe game's only fifty nine dollars, which is a pretty decent deal off the MSRP's, which are, would be forty nine and sixty nine, I believe. Um, it says it's a thirty to sixty minute playtime game, um, a unique. Uh, dice pushing mechanic that where you activate two actions per turn based on these dice you roll. Um, it just it looks new 
as far as the mechanics are concerned. Oh. It's a 4X game that plays under an hour. I'm interested, and it's not crazy expensive. Nice. So check it out. That's Rise of Tribes. And then this last one, it took me a while before I finally pulled the trigger on this, but I had to. So it's called <laughs> The Component Collector. And it is, it's kind of like a a wooden base. So this is a, not a game. It's a, a supplement. Accessory. Accessory. I like that. Um, so imagine that it's you have this wooden rectangle that holds eight coasters. But the coasters have depth to them. And they come in various sizes. So you can have ones that have like a little circular uh, bowl. You can have squares. You can have one that has like four different squares. One that has like slots to put cards in. And you can mix and match these. And each one of them comes with six different... Um, I'm going to call them coasters for visual thoughts and you can get them in different <laughs> colors and they have little magnets next to them so when you pull them out you can arrange them so they all stick together and they're meant to like control or organize all your components so if you have Whilst a game you're playing the game well you're playing the game right right so i got a blue one a green one a red one and a purple one so i call purple done <laughs> i got blue green josh gets green and then the other That's one, one of the quirks that listeners may not know about us is we almost always play the same colors if they are available in games. Yep, yep, blue, purple, green, and then if there's no purple, I almost always play black. Yep, Sydney grabs red or pink. Mm -hmm. So it makes it easy though, because then you're like, okay, yeah, I, I know what color everyone is. Yeah. You're One like my time. local barman. You just put the usual in front of me. It's great. Yep. So, but I'm looking forward to these. These are the first. I I backed the set of four, which is a two hundred dollars. <laughs> of course <laughs> but you can get this you can get the base one for like 44 dollars, and it's just yeah. like the one but i'm like i need four i can't just get one there's four of us that could play games so anyway i'm surprised you didn't get six I, if there had been more colors you would have it was it was Don't lie. it was rough to do 200 dollars for some reason i'm just like <laughs> it's not a game but it's something i will use for every single game we play, why am I having so many wishy-washy feelings about it? And then I'm like, no, I got to get this. If I don't get this and I see someone else using it, I'm like, oh, why didn't I get it? And then I would have spent way more money later. So Sure, sure. <laughs> the, these justifications of your habit. Sure. Yeah. All right. That's all okay. the Kickstarter stuff for this week. So let's go to some feedback about past episodes. If you have feedback about this or any of our previous episodes, email us or go to our Board Game Geek forums easily found at tabletopgametalk.com slash BGG. I also feel like I should throw in our email address is tabletopgametalk at gmail.com. That was, yes. Good idea. For some reason mm. that wasn't written here. <laughs> well, I took off the email address, although I'm always happy to get email. Yeah. Always happy to get email. Um, the BGG forum is allows you to be like in a conversation so if That's you want to do true. feedback you can always do it there but yes you can always email us for anything um I, it's a little I, more private yeah. you just have like a little comment you might not want to get into a big conversation i don't know yep no, that's true that's true so we have uh, a, a some feedback from the sydney the sydney as in <laughs> chris's fiance um who says uh love the conversation on gamification it's currently a hot topic in the business world too from internal friendly competitions between departments to employee rankings for promotions, companies are exploding with gamified ways to increase morale and decrease employee turnover. Actual gaming aside, Avalon makes for a baller icebreaker at a new higher social. Competitions for departments uh, that exercise the most, for instance, or waste the least paper or bring their lunches instead of buying are fantastic ways to bond with other employees. While competitions for new company logo or best submissions of new idea, etc. benefit the company and increase morale incredibly. Gamification at its finest. Yeah. Sydney so mentioned, she's like, I have so many comments that I want to tell you and I, I think you should say them on the show. I'm like, well, then you have to email us. Yeah. <laughs> so you made her email us. I made, I made her email us, yeah. Um, but I think she brings up some really good points here because when we were talking gamification, a lot of times we were crossing over into educational games. But what she was like, well... If you look at companies, they do it all the time. And right. I didn't really think about it. like my company will do a weight loss challenge, like three months, like three months dense. Everyone who wants in will do a challenge. And our Do they do weight loss now or is it the most exercise? Because I thought they eliminated weight loss challenges after too many incidents like the episode of The Office where they all <laughs> start themselves fainting. start I, fainting. <laughs> we've never got into Ingesting the... tapeworms. <laughs> yeah. That was one of the things that was done in that episode. Yeah, our challenges are more like if you gain weight, you're disqualified. 
And then the winners usually has like, oh, I lost three pounds. So <laughs> we have not had an issue of people starving themselves. That's good. Um, no Kellys in your office. <laughs> no. And, and also the winner. So the loser had to buy dinner for the winner. So oh. actually, actually buy dinner for everybody, which is also kind of counterintuitive, right? Because you're like, oh, cutting back and eating out and all that kind of stuff. But if you lose the weight loss challenge, then you have to buy dinner for everyone else. And that's the... <laughs> that's, wow, that's kind of... That's kind of shamey. I'd be, I'd be <laughs> really ashamed that I'm going to have to fork out all this money now for because I lost. But it's good motivation, though. Well, right? sure. No, so, I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. And actually, as we got more and more people that wanted to join in, it turned into like, okay, the bottom two, the bottom three, the bottom four. So basically, like the lower third, third would buy dinner for the upper two thirds. So here's my here's my thing on this because um, uh, I'm temping at Group One at the moment, and and they're doing a similar thing where the the tasks that we have to do our team. Um, that have been hired on as temps is uh, quantifiable so you know we can get through an entry uh, so you can you know per day he's like well you know our boss is like well you can probably get through about 90 we think it's reasonable so and all the numbers are visible to everyone so there's a game in itself yep. can I be the top out of all this team that's been hired um, but it had unintended consequences and sometimes these gamified things in the workplace can because if people want to game the system they will and if there's ways to do it they will so there was different types of entry that were quicker than others. And some people were uh, filtering all the fast ones. Yeah, they were just yeah. doing the fast ones. And it was and it was kind of obvious if you knew that they you would look through their list and see what they were doing. But yeah, sometimes yeah. you can have unintended consequences. Yeah, I will say definitely for like the workplace, be careful that you, your gamification can't be gamed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So and that's why we kind of you know keep it to shorter stints. But I, I like the exercise challenges. Um, I like our current office is like they're trying to promote not using disposable cups. Right. So that's more of a shameification as well. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Love I like that. that term. Love that term. <laughs> Coin. You've heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that works really well, right? We've used that a lot, where you don't want to be the person called out, you know, in the bottom of the list. Um, yeah. But you can you obviously you can flip it around. It's like here's the top ten. But honestly, just staying off the bottom ten is yeah. fun. Um, be careful with doing that though, because if someone's like, "Well, I can't participate, so I'm always at the bottom," it's like uh, you have to make sure everyone's into the game. Sure. All right. Next. All right. Back to some feedback from Christy. Um, she sent us a super nice email after our games at Origin, and she had a question that we're going to discuss here. So she said. Um, Century Spice Road is getting compared to Splendor a lot. Um, we also played Pandemic Iberia, and lots of people have at least one version of Pandemic in their collections already. When a game comes out that is similar to an older game, how do you decide which one belongs in your collection? Do you aim to have a, ri- a variety of mechanics, player counts, etc.? How distinctive does something have to be in order to make it worth owning? So if something like Isle of Sky is coming out and you already have Carcassonne, what do you do? Assuming you're not Kitty and Carcassonne's not your favorite game. (laughs) (laughs) I think this is a really good question and we may end up making this a topic. But looking at my topic list, it was like, okay, this is going to be really far in the future if we do. So I wanted to kind of address it here. Now, you guys have much smaller game collections than I do. (laughs) So I'm more interested in what would replace a a game for you. Hmm. Because for me, it's just like, eh. I, I'll just have, have them both. You have all the games. That's right. True. Yeah. So for me, I think it has to fill a different category. The way that Christy said this, there are lots of different ways you consider a game. So even though something like um, Century Spice Road and Splendor are similar in some ways, um, I believe they have very different player counts. I think Century Spice Road plays more people. Yeah, Splendor goes up to four. Um, and Century, I think you can go to six. I, th- I think it goes five or six. Yeah. Um, and I'm always looking for games that play more people because that always seems to be my problem is um, I had people over for dinner. We want to pull out a game. We don't have something that plays everyone sitting there. What are we going to do? We don't want to split. So we end up playing the same three games over and over. So I'm looking for different player counts most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, definitely, like, if it's adding something extra, like, if there was a game that came out was similar, but it was just much better at that type of thing, 
I would totally swap it out. Or maybe even a, a really strong theme that I was absolutely in love with. I mean, it would have to really be something I was passionate about. Like my favorite anime series had this great board game. Then maybe I'd swap it out for some other theme that I didn't like so much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe maybe only those, those two things. Well, Confession, I have yet to remove a game from my collection. I am I have a fledgling collection. And so I haven't said goodbye to anything really yet. I oh, so yeah. I'm not and really sure what's small. gonna kick things out. I know what will bring new games into my collection, but I I don't know yet what's gonna be the thing that kicks things out. Yeah, for or me- if I'm just a hoarder like Chris and we just don't know it yet. Yeah, you just yeah don't do it. But <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's tricky though because um let's take a look at Catan. Catan basic game farming, you know building building up an island you know it's a very generic theme but i can introduce that to people who have not played gaming and the theme is not going to put anyone off star trek Catan is the exact same game with the option of adding some extra things in basically just like ability cards on top of star trek Catan. you would think that if i own star trek Catan, i wouldn't need to own the base Catan at all but I own both, and partly because the base Catan supports more types of expansions. So if I want to play five or six players, or if I want to add in any of the other expansions, I still need to have the base. But I have Star Trek Catan because those people who are a little bit less prone on wanting to play board games, if they like Star Trek, maybe they'll sit down and play that. So it, they're very, very close. Pandemic um, pandemic uh, Cthulhu, I think is, is yes. what they called. It is a different game than base pandemic uh pandemic iberia is a different game than base pandemic but it gives you kind of that same feel and i think that depending so for those ones um i would say almost everyone has played pandemic um with someone else and maybe if you don't own it yet in your collection already you're going to go and pick up iberia or cthulhu or one of the other different versions of pandemic because oh my friend already has the regular pandemic so i'm gonna get this other one so when we're at different houses we get to play all the different versions yeah well it's also tricky like if you play pandemic and you love pandemic getting an offshoot of it it may feel like it's not the game you love you know and if it's like eh, it's it's okay it changes a few things i'd rather play the original you know and then you're stuck with it right you know so it's it's hard to for me to decide when to switch over. I do want to say Century Spice Road and Splendor, even though they feel a lot like you should compare them, we just got done playing a game of Splendor because I'm like, all right, we just played Century Spice Road. We can I I've been doing it, comparing it to Splendor, and they have similar feels. Splendor's still more streamlined. It's an easier game to get to the table. It's an yeah. easier game to teach. I don't know. I felt like I had a much harder time with resource management with Splendor because the chips are so limited. With Century Spice Road, I was much more focused on my card management, and that was a lot easier for me to be able to see what was on the table. And there was always something available, whereas a lot of times Splendor, I felt like the table was controlling my choices. I felt like in Century Spice Road, I was controlling what I was doing, not somebody else. Well, and that might be that feeling, though, right? Because... Um, in Splendor, you don't have a hand of cards that give you actions. You just have a set of actions you can take. But if you imagine in in Sentry, if you made those same actions, you know, take one of take three different cubes or take two of a single color cube or something like that. Now you're kind of saying, "Oh, I'm playing with the same actions," and you're almost playing a similar thing. Mm. But to me, they're different enough. Even though I can say, if you like Splendor, you'll probably like Sentry. Yeah, they're different enough where I'm like. In this situation, I would want to play Splendor. And in this inter- situation, I would want to play Sentry. Yeah. I think I like Sentry Space Road better. All right. Might just be because I was introduced to I think there's to more complexity first. to it and there was more to think about. For me, actually, and I've only played Sentry once, so I might True. actually really get into it because um, I play Splendor a lot. But yeah, for me, it was it, it was a little bit hard to get into just because I had more to think about. But I think if I played it more, I would be like, okay, this is cool. There's more yeah. strategy. There's more depth, maybe. Yep. Yeah, and I, I do like the being able to buy actions and have that separate from the cubes. There's there's more depth to Sentry. There's a little bit more fiddly to Sentry. Um, Splendor's more streamlined. They both will give you a similar feel, but both are valid games to stay in the collection. Sure. Um, all right, we'll end, we'll end the 
question segment on a on a silly one. This one's from Sam. <laughs> Sam, not to say your question isn't silly, but it is. Um, during the gamification episodes, you started with the five of you, Kitty, Josh, Sydney, Spencer, and you, uh, stated that the five of you, would split up to see Origins. Kitty's reply was that she needs a buddy. I'm getting Scooby-Doo vibes off that comment and want to know which Scooby-Doo characters does each person map to and what hijinks did you meddling kids get into while exploring? I wonder if this is because I said Rudy, Rudy, Lou at the end. Rudy, Rudy, Lou, where <laughs> are you? Just... <laughs> but the thing is, I can't remember all of their personality types. Like, I know uh shaggy was like the kind of like white like kind of aloof like oh silly like not really yeah, paying attention shaggy. to most oh well yeah i was giving go. josh yeah. scooby-doo i thought spencer was shaggy yeah. Yeah. actually we could they could go either Cause way because they, they're they're kind of like peas in a pod scooby <laughs> right. and shaggy yeah, that's they, true. they yeah. are and you and spencer are definitely the very similar yeah, yeah. and sydney is daphne and chris is fred and i'm velma yeah I think, that, I think it maps really well. I think it does map pretty well. Yeah. yeah. And I'm always one who's like, no, we shouldn't split up. And that's always Velma. And she's always right. But see, yeah. that yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to map personalities, though, I think. <laughs> I'm thinking about this way too much. You are. You I are. I mean, yeah. I don't know even know what Fred did, though. He just walked around and did nothing. He just seemed um, boring to me. No the, offense. He was He's the like, cool guy. <laughs> he was, he <laughs> was the <laughs> handsome <laughs> orange ascot. Come he, on. <laughs> he was, he was kind of like the quarterback at high school or whatever. I don't yeah. know. He was he just seemed boring to me, Chris. I'm so sorry that we've labeled you as the boring character. <sighr> All right, fine. Cuz you're he's more kind interesting than leader. Chris. He's he always the leader one who and says, Chris is like, yeah, you know Chris what? We should us, split sure. up. And even though Velma's always like this is a bad idea, everyone always splits up. That's I didn't true. watch enough Scooby Doo. This is what's going on here. All right. Yeah. So oh my gosh, what we, we know is so Scooby Doo Marathon mm-hmm. and I need to find a decent Scooby Doo game. That we can oh, all play the I characters. About and we're going to get you so. an orange ascot for a Gen Con show. Done. I'm not <laughs> cosplaying Fred. <laughs> Maybe. So let's, um, being the leader I am, get off this topic and on to our real topic. Shall we? In this episode, we're talking about demoing games. Is this a good way to learn new games? Can we use demoing techniques at home? And what games are good for demoing and what ones are not? Yeah, so I wanted to talk about this because I this this convention more than any other, I sat down and tried to demo a lot more games because I wanted to try to get a good feel for things to talk about on the show. And I liked certain aspects of the demos and I just kind of felt like this was it's worth considering can we use this concept of demoing games as a way of teaching? So we've talked about teaching games as like, oh, run through a a couple turns and then reset the game. But oftentimes what happens if you try to do that, if you run through a couple turns and everyone's like, no, 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 let's just Just keep keep going. Just keep playing, yeah. Right. So if we set up a game and say, okay, the game's all set up. I know how to play it. You two don't. I set up the game and, and it's like, Maybe like the start of a game, I've taken away a few things, but I'm like, okay, we're going to play to eight points when normally you'd play to 15 points and just play that shorter game with a few things taken out. Is that worthwhile versus just like, okay, playing the whole game, we're going to play for two and a half hours. And at the end, you're going to be like, well, only if I had known this or known that, or if I'd know how the end game would have scored, then I would have done these different things. Like, what do you guys think of that? It's a tough one because there's a sort of catch-22 where if you didn't play the whole game through, there'd be part of you that would feel a little bit unsatisfied. Like, oh, I just, I felt like I just got going. Maybe if you, if we were sat down to play a game at your house versus like a convention. Um, But then I really like the idea of learning by doing. And I think it is superior to a lot of the times I learn games from people you know I'm hearing them speak a lot about all the rules and I'd rather just jump in and then explain the rules as we go so yeah it's tough I mean there's pros and cons to both um I think demoing works really well in the convention setting because you're trying to get as many demos in as you can a lot of the time you're trying to get table to table and they're trying to turn people over too they want as many people to see their games as they can but at home You've got the time. I don't know. So, I, I So I don't know if there's um, very many things that I... There are some techniques I would use yeah, that elements. they use to teach. Yeah, elements of it. But I don't like the idea of like, we're not going to play the full version. We're not going to have all the elements. We're not, because then it feels like the next time you play, 
you're relearning the game. There's more to it that you haven't seen before that you have to consider that, you know, maybe that first game was going to be a wash anyway, but now I've got two games that are going to be kind of meh. Meh. Well, so um, Sydney and I right now are playing Star Wars Rebellion. This is a two-player game. They say you can play it four players, but no matter how you cut it, it's a two-player game. (laughs) Um, The four players is just you take teams, and then you kind of say, okay, you make half the decisions, and you make the other half of the decisions. It's a two-player game, but it's a fantastic (laughs) two-player game. But in this game, it's about six hours of of. Two players playing. It's wow. like this huge. I have a like a four and a half foot by four and a half foot table, and it takes up the entire table. It's like massive. And when you play this, it's like for your first game, set the game up this way. Don't use these abilities. Remove these cards, and then play your first game. Most of the rules are there. Eighty percent plus of the rules are there. But like advanced setup, like how like your own setup, you wouldn't do um, the extra ability cards for your leaders. You don't they are removed for your first game, and that to me is kind of using this demo mentality of learn the basics and then add up this other stuff. Don't worry about setup because setup is hard to do if you've never played the game before. Like Catan. Your first time playing Catan, oops, I put my first two settlements in the wrong spot. Now I have absolutely no chance of winning this game. That would come out much better if it said, you know, the first time you play it, here's an arrangement for a three-player game. Here's an arrangement for a four-player game. Just start with this board and play the game. It's a valid game, but just start there. So what do you think there? Where It's like that start with a a simple, not a simple, but a predetermined setup, and then your next game okay, here's how you will do the custom setup and custom powers. Yeah, it sounds like the sort of tutorial level for a, a, a video game, you know, that that slimmed down version um, that allows you to not make those mistakes, like you said, that you would if you were playing the more advanced full-on game. I think it's great. I think it's a great idea for the right games. Like you said, Catan, it works well. Some games, it probably wouldn't. And sure. I can't, off the top of my head, I can't think of, of good examples. Splendor's where Splendor's a good example where you could make a demo out of it, but you wouldn't. Right. Because there isn't much to slim down left, right. probably. Yeah. I mean, if I wanted to make a demo out of that game, I'd remove the row three cards. Right. I would say we're playing to eight points instead of 15. Yep. And I'd remove all the dukes. Right. You know, you get the feel for the game. You get the feel for how the end of score happens. Things happen pretty quickly. But... Even less to think about. Even, Even less to think yeah. about. Yeah, and that's that. I that does help. Yeah, I mean, especially for me, like I, you know, I'm in Spencer's camp. You know, too many rules just confuses me very quickly. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I would love that the streamlined version. I think that would work well. Um, and I, and I think the 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 whole point of demoing is that you're kind of learning by doing. You don't sit there for half an hour and hear someone speaking like, oh, here's this rule, here's that rule. You just do it. Um, and then you hear them talk the rules through as they come up. And I really like that way of learning the game. What did you guys think of um, Near and Far? Because when we set that game up, uh, we went through, read the rules, set it up to the dusk side of the town, played it, and then once you got done, you you flip the next page and say, oh, and for your next game, here are some advanced actions you can use. It it kind of like... play all the advanced actions right now (laughs) right it's like is so that's still kind of the same thing where it's like this intro game to the full game so i really like games that have that kind of thing built into the game um because you're not you don't feel like you're missing out as much like with near and far there's different maps that you're playing. So yeah, you still get to explore the story elements of that first map, even if you're not using all the actions. Um, For uh, Battle for Hogwarts is a really good example. You start year one and you slowly add in more and more until it gets super complicated and really hard. But those first few games, you're like, oh, I got this. And it's it's part of the game is built in is leading you through this path. Yep. I like games like that a lot. Well, Battle of Hogwarts is an interesting uh, one as well because when Josh and I demoed this t- last Gen Con, yeah, um, they actually had a demo of the game where they took the first three years, mixed in the cards and and the villains, and it was. It wasn't spoilerish, so you didn't know that you were seeing all those, but it introduced a number of concepts all at once 
for the demo and that made the demo was like super super hard i think they told us like nobody had won it you know or someone came close to winning it or something um which then again is that a good demo or a bad demo where everyone's losing if you lose your first game do you want to go back and say okay i i think i got it i know i'm i'm going to play this right so is that a good way of demoing something especially if you're trying to sell it yeah i think it does have that element of I mean, it's, it's got to be for the right player, but yeah, oh my God, we were close, but we didn't win. Like, oh, I just want to beat it now. I want to buy that game and we're going to all sit down one time and we're going to complete this thing. I okay. think it's great if you can make sure that people can get close. If you are demoing something and no one is getting anywhere near winning, I feel like that's just going to be so frustrating for people. They're going to be like, no. I'm getting crushed in this game. Yeah. This Never is insanely this game. hard. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And they did not have a problem with getting people to sit down. Like we had to like sh- wake up bright and early just to sign up for a demo spot on that game. Um, so I think they had kind of an advantage of the IP sort of drove people yeah. to the table. Love the yeah, everyone loves the theme. Yeah, yeah. So and apparently they're coming out with an expansion soon. Ooh. So you know, I I don't know. I I mean I do think I know, but um, it was hinted at at some point. Oh. I did have a point from um, an earlier thing that you said, Christo. Um, these games that are six hour, you have to sit down, you've got to be committed. I think that those might be better games to benefit from this kind of demoing at home, this, yeah. this concept that you've come up with, um, because they are the ones that do have the more complex strategies. They're the ones where if you get halfway through the game and you feel like you messed up, you're, you just want to scrap it. Those ones really can benefit from, all right, we're going to play a short version, not all the rules, but enough rules that you can wrap your head around the concept of the game. We'll do this quick, and now you're ready for the real game. Yeah. I think those are the games that really can benefit from this style of looking at things. I'm interested, do do those kinds of, like, you know, six-hour marathon, uh, you know, TR3 or whatever it's called, <laughs> um, do they even get demoed at uh, game conventions does that happen when they come out they'll they'll get demoed for sure okay yeah. and they and they probably do this streamlining yeah. thing right? so actually star trek ascendancy is a good example they were running demos of that last year at gen con right and it was essentially like an hour and a half to two hour demo okay. where you weren't playing to finish the game you were just kind of playing through and each time you got to another point where you needed a rules explained the person who's demoing it would then teach you that aspect of the game okay and when you got done, and, and it was like just a time limit, like, okay, time's up, you know, you'd be, all right, your game's not finished, you walk away, but then you knew how to play everything, and then you could go buy the game, go home, uh, and play it. So, so it's a way to teach you the game rather than actually play it through. Exactly. So, it, I mean, and you're going to hit all of the different high points in that two-hour time frame. You're also going to decide, is this something I want to buy in that time frame? And that's really at conventions a lot of the sit down and plays are, do I want to spend my money on this? Because some of these games are big investments if they're real heavy games. Right. Yep. And you don't want to be like, oh, I just spent all this money on something I hate. Yeah, that makes this sense. This is a great way to know, like get a feel for it. Yeah. I mean, I definitely don't think that every game um, deserves a demo. Or like if like to, all right, teach this in a shortened version or a demo version or have a version of the game that's light. And then you add on. I think tactical games would benefit from it, especially initial setup games. You, we talked about my game a little bit, Primal Rush. Right. In in the instruction book there, I'm like, for your first game, set the board up this way. Because it creates a board where everyone is kind of on equal playing ground, equal playing field. Um, and when you move and do something, it's not like random anymore. It's like you can see everything and you can just focus on how do I move around? How do I attack? As opposed to, okay, how do I deal with all this terrain differences that are coming up randomly? You also don't feel in your first game like the board is against you. Right. Like you just have no chance because that does happen. And especially in games like Catan or your game where there's a randomized board, there, you can just like sit there and be like, the universe has spoken yeah. against me this time and it's no fun. Yeah, especially if it's your first time playing. It's yeah. very discouraging. Right. But I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think it, it would maybe benefit some of these big juggernaut games where you play for ages, maybe even starting like kind of halfway through. I mean, does that ever happen? Do sometimes they set up the board and you're already, you know, kind of halfway into a game and it's like, okay, you're going to play this 
So this is going to sound like an intentional segue, but it was accidental, but it's a good one nonetheless. <laughs> so we have a couple of people on BGG, and Steve actually mentioned, um, I'm going to read the first paragraph here. He's like, I'm not a huge fan of game demos. Perfect example was Dark Souls. The demo was fine, but it only showed you how the boss battles worked, which was the only small portion of the game. And you were fighting a boss with no equipment, which would never happen in the game. So by removing a lot of the options and content, you got a completely different experience. Dark Souls was hyped as an extremely difficult game, and the demo was made it look even more difficult than the actual game was by limiting the content included, which gave people an unreal- unrealistic expectations. So in this case, they like, oh, let's fast forward you to the end game, where we think it's the most interesting. Right. And here's how you fight a boss, even though you haven't had time to build up your characters. Yeah. And when you miss all those in-between steps, you don't, first, you don't learn the strategy to be able to take those bigger steps. And you don't have the, well, this sounds even worse because you don't have the equipment. You would think, though, that they would give you like a base equipment, like, all right, here's the three things we think are most important. I don't know. That it sounds, sounds a like they kind of poorly messed, thought out. Yeah, exactly. Like they, yeah. they didn't quite design that demo yeah. properly. But there is a game, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping this is the right name. I believe it's Dungeon Lords, where the game in the rule book. So the way this works is a lot of the European Euro type of games where you build up an economy, and then once you're done at the end of a season or a phase or uh, mostly like a season type idea, you go and do something else with what you've built up. In the instruction book, there are puzzles in the book that set up that second phase of things. So you have to defeat a number of heroes that are coming into your dungeon because you're trying to build up your dungeon. And it's like, okay, so here are the things you have available to you. Here are the heroes that are coming in. Solve this puzzle. And that was part of the instruction book where you'd set up, set up these puzzles and play through that using the actual rules. So then when they went back and explained the first part of it, you knew why you might want more minions here or more food there or more weapons here because you were aware of the different scenarios that could happen in the second half. So in that case, though, they gave you a full thing that may have actually been something that you you know, that you know built up towards. And I think that's an interesting way of teaching a game that's really complicated as well. Because why spend an hour and a half on that first part when you get to the second part, you're like, oh, well, I didn't know this was what I was planning for. You know, so games like that, you kind of need that sort of end goal demo to go along. Sometimes with that. that can work where you're where you're actually focusing on on the end bit, just so you can learn what you're what you're going for. Right, right, nice. So Michael actually also replied to me. Michael, Michael, we know does a lot of demos, and he's mm-hmm. done a lot of feedback on the fact that he's done demos and feedback on our rule books and all that kind of things. Um, And his feedback, I think we agree with him here, is having run a ton of demos myself, I can say that it absolutely depends on the game. Some lend themselves well to it, and the demo helps showcase what's good about the game. Others, there's no way around showing the full game to get the point across. Um, Publishers are usually really on point on knowing what games to demo well and what games will not not demo well. However, he keeps a special caveat for new publishers and self-published games and Kickstarter games where, you know, you have to, you're trying to sell your game in a really short period of time. So you have to be a little bit more careful what kind of demo you can present and how to present that. Um, But I don't know, I've just seen, I I think it's interesting concept in that phased, maybe, maybe it's not demos, maybe it's just this phased learning games. I'm sticking with my answer of, the more complicated the game, the more willing I am to give you this. It's worth it. All right. Well, let's talk about a few of the demos that we did at Origins. Yes. Um, the first one was Potion Explosion. Great game. Yeah. Yep. And it is not a game that I have played before, even though it's been a hot game. Um, everyone who's played it has liked it. It's If you haven't played Potion Explosion, there's a, there's a, a box you put together inside the box, but it, it has five different columns, I believe, or six different columns. It's six. And you put marbles in this little bin, and the, the marbles flow down into the different columns. The idea is on your turn, you're going to remove one of the marbles, and if it makes two marbles touch that are the same color, then you move all of that color. And if those touch of the same color, you move all of that color. those are the explosions. Those are your explosions. And then you take these colored marbles and you're trying to add them to different potions you're trying to make. And you drop the potions are little cardboard potion shaped things with little holes in there. And each one has different needs for different colors. So I 
kind of avoided it as, as more of a, like, eh, it's just Candy Crush in board game form. Not really super interested in it. And But the demo, it's like, oh, we're demoing this. You know, it's going to be a half hour. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, for a half hour, I'll sit down and check this out. And and like that game, so I knew about it. I don't think you guys had known about it. Nope. So from people who don't know what to expect, how did how, that demo, what did you like or not like about it? Yeah, I mean, just the kinetic feel of it alone. Um, I mean, you know, with tabletop gaming, you get that a lot. But it's the fact that you're pulling these marbles out and they are falling down. It's that very kind of tactile, immediate thing that you get with, say, Jenga or something. I really liked it partly for that reason. Um, I thought the demo was done very well, but it was just the game itself was really good. And I loved the chaining thing. So, yeah, I had a great time. I felt like I wanted the other potions because <laughs> like, um, the the lady who demoed it for us was really good. I thought she was very knowledgeable about the game, really good at explaining it. Um, so after her little explanation, she was like, all right, so these are the potions we're playing with. And I could see there were other potions in the box. I'm like, how much more complicated can it really be? Can it really take us that much longer to add these like three other potions into the mix? I don't know. That's Maybe it's because point. we're experienced gamers, so we pick up on things pretty quick. We, Me and Josh have been conditioned by Chris to learn rules quickly. Chris drills games into us on a weekly to bi-weekly basis. So I, I don't know. I, I just... <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a hard taskmaster. It's true. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I just felt like... Give I, me I the wanted potions. to play the whole game. Give me the potions. <laughs> so, but, but it was really fun, and I won. Right. And we went back to try to get the game later, which is yeah. not a hard game to get in general, but they just didn't have enough copies at the show. They were having shipping issues, they said. Yep. So, and and basically what she did is explain, it's like, well, normally you'd need five potions to do this, but for the demo, it's three. And normally you'd have this many different potion options, but for the demo, it's just these few, um, you know, so you don't have to learn all of them. I actually kind of liked that. It made it so that even though I played the demo, I, it made me feel like if I buy the game, I get like a free expansion. She did a really good job of letting us know what was demo and what was part of the actual game. So it didn't feel like if I bought this game and got it home, I'd be like, oh, man, I don't know what I'm doing now. Right. You know, she gave us all the rundown on what we were missing. Yep. And we were playing to, I think, um, three or four achievements or whatever before it triggered the end of the game, as opposed to like the seven or eight, which would be a full game. Which is, it was an interesting way of doing the demo. Just, you know, remove a few components. Like, these ones are just a little bit more advanced. Not over your head. Just unnecessary to learn the mechanics of the game. And we're going to shorten it. Because you'll you'll get the feel for the game by the time. And I definitely feel like we got the feel. And it was really fun still. Yeah. All right. Spoils of War. Um, if you've not played Spoils of War, this is Liar's Dice with a a set collection mechanic to it. And betting mechanic to it. So everyone starts out with, I believe, a 45 gold or some, 70, I think it was. 70 gold. Yeah. Um, and then it was Liar's Dice where everyone rolls a cup of dice. Uh, you have six dice, I believe, or five or six. And you go around the table. It's like, I have two twos. And Kitty might say, well, I have three twos. And, or not I have, I believe on the table for all the yes. dice that everyone's rolled, I believe there's at least two twos. And Kitty would say, well, I think there are three twos. And you Josh have to might go say, higher than the person before you. Right. So you're either a higher number or you can reset the number by increasing the number of dice. Um, at some point, someone's going to say, I challenge you on that. And then everyone on the table gets to bet on either the challenger or the person being challenged. And if you win, you get to keep your gold. If you lose, you lose your gold. You just straight up lose your gold. Um, you don't get to... There's The, the betting mechanic was a little weird because it didn't feel like... I felt like if I won, I should have gotten gold back. Right. Yeah. But you only can only lose gold. But the person with the most gold wagered would choose from these cards first. And that, those would be your kind of collecting sets and getting points. Um, and then in this game, he, it was almost a full demo, but... We didn't do tier two or tier three cards? I think we just played, it's usually a three round game, and we played the first round. Right. So usually you, and it is, you feel like you're playing multiple rounds because you play like three rounds in the first age, I think is what it's called. Right. And then you play three rounds in the second. So we don't only play the first age. Um, and I thought it was a really fun demo, except 
Sydney's really good at liar's dice, so she knew all the betting mechanics, and Josh kept betting these exorbitant amounts of money, <laughs> and I felt like I was just like, oh, I'm just limping along here. <laughs> I like I like playing poker, so it was definitely, my mentality was go big or go home, so I was just putting tons of chips out there. It was kind of like all-in scenario. Yeah. Well, that's kind of a fun thing about demos, too. So I listen to a lot of podcasts on role-playing games, and we talk about campaigns versus one-shots. A campaign, you're playing the same characters in multiple sessions, and a one-shot, you're only playing it in one session. In a one-shot, you're much more likely to risk the life of your character than in a campaign. And I feel like a demo is kind of a one-shot board game, <laughs> where it's like, well, I'm only going to be here sitting here for 15, 20 minutes. I'm going to do crazy things that I wouldn't necessarily do if I was committed to an hour long or plus game so when josh is like oh yeah i'm gonna bet 70 gold on this bet if he hits it he's gonna win and if he misses like eh, no harm loss is like what's right. 10 15 minutes of my life that was definitely my, my mentality yeah but uh yeah no it was a great game uh i thought it was explained well um and it was it was just easy to pick up so it, it lended itself well to the demo i do think we tended to pick the easier games to demo because we were just kind of like wandering and it was like whatever table was empty at that moment and these ones were kind of quick turnaround yep. easy to pick Casual up games, games. Yeah. yeah yeah well and 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 the thing with spoils of war and it is a good game if you like liar's dice and you like a fantasy theme and you have a game group that really vikings. likes liar's dice and vikings yep um then it's a good game but i walked away saying it's liar's dice with a theme and if I'm going to play Liar's Dice, I'm going to play it because other people don't aren't, aren't big gamers, and it's something that you can get anyone to play. But if I have a theme on top of it, it's likely going to take it beyond that casual game, or beyond the casual gamer. And now I'm like, well, I can't play Liar's Dice. I, I, I don't really want to play Liar's Dice, but I can't really play this with casual gamers anymore because it's not casual enough anymore. Um Although I really did like it. I thought it was pretty it was still pretty casual. I don't I don't think it really took it up that too many notches. No. I think I could I could get anyone to play that. All right. Well if you can get Glory to play it, then I'll pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> um I think my possibly my favorite of the games we demoed was Raise Your Goblets. Yep. That one I I mean, I don't think any of us picked up the game, but it was a really fun time to just sit and play this game. And um, one of the people who was demoing games for them actually sat down with us to learn because he hadn't been through this one either. So we were playing with um, with him and the lady who was teaching us the game was having a ton of fun. It's a really silly theme. You're trying to poison everyone and there's these drops and there's wine and it really seems like it's just waiting to be turned into a drinking game. Yeah, I think this game... So... Um... Previous, I forgot to mention, again, Spoils of War was the game we previous were talking about. Raise Your Goblet, this one. Um, Raise Your Goblet is cool mini or not. You start out with three drops of wine, wine two drops of poison, and two drops of antidote. Um, you're going to be adding it to your goblet, which you can't look at. You can't see what's inside of It's a of real goblet. goblet. It's a yeah. real goblet. Yeah. And your goblets are going to, on your turn, you can say swap or switch left, switch right, or you can swap your goblet with somebody else's, or you can peek into your goblet, or you can drop up to two drops in your goblet. And so you get two actions per turn. Two actions per turn. So you can do, um, so dropping a drop is an action, but you can do any of those things and you pick two of them on your turn. If you have no wine for your first action, you can say, I call a toast. And then everyone drinks the wine in front of them. And if you have more poison than antidote in your wine, you die. If you have the most wine in your goblet, you get a point. If you kill the person that you were supposed to kill, so everyone has a, a Even person. If you don't kill them. They just happen to die. That yep. counts too. <laughs> yep. If the person you wanted to kill dies, works. If you if you survive, you get a point as well. So you can get up to three points in, in a round. Four points with a bonus. Four points if you, yeah, if you are alive and kill your target. Yes. So it's a very quick game. Um, I'm not sure there's any strategy to it whatsoever, but I still had a good time. It was really fun. <laughs> well, there are um, – so we played one round without the special character cards and then one round with the character cards. I really liked that way of doing the demo where you figure out the basics and then you get the next step. And it didn't feel like everything you learned in that first round was just a waste. It was still really – it's such an easy game that it still felt like fun. It didn't feel like – 
oh man, I just wasted all that strategy because there is not that much strategy. Just kind of luck of the draw, throwing things around, see what happens. Yep. Quick, easy game. I think this would be a really fun party game. You can play with a ton of people. Yeah, I, I think, think they said up to 12. Yeah, oh, yeah. So there's six goblets, but you can play teams where one person on the team is the, te- the, the taster. The taster. And, but they may, like, there's a kind of a hidden role yeah. thing there. So they, one of the tasters is evil and wants you to die. But you have to trust your taster because you can't look in the goblet. Only your, Only taster, your taster can, can look in the goblet. <laughs> So and that's like another level of the game. So it's still that same concept of kind of the staged learning and adding things as you go. So I think that was that was pretty cool. Um, I might end up picking that one up. It was really fun. <laughs> I, I think we're gonna eventually talk about um, party games. Well, not party games. Well, maybe party games, but like board game parties. And I think these kinds of games are the types of games that work really well. Yeah. At a board game party, where you can sit down and have a number of people. A lot of people playing. Yep. Simple rules, but keep you going. Um, Josh, you were interested in Ghost Blitz at one point, right? I was. I uh, I actually didn't end up demoing this game, but I did. I did see other people play it, and uh, there's there's a. It's a very very casual game. Um, there's like five objects. Uh, is a barrel, a mouse, a wine thing, and a couple of other things. A ghost. Yeah, and they have different a colors. Chair. A chair. Uh, yeah. That was it. <laughs> I'm glad someone was paying attention. Me and Chris did end up demoing <laughs> yeah. this game. Oh, you did? Yep. We did. Well, then, brilliant. You can explain it better than me. Go, go for no, it. No, no, no. You know it. Yeah. Oh, well, you I, got it. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> anyway, the idea is that you flip a card over and there's um, pictured is some of the objects that, that are out on the table. Um, and you have to see on the card which um, color or thing is not represented. So it could be that there's a barrel that's blue and a chair that's green. And so you have to try and grab something from those objects that's sitting on the table that isn't represented there. So it's kind of, it's weird. You kind of have to, in your mind, flip it round. It's not a barrel. It's not a chair. It's not red and it's not green. Exactly. It's a ghost. Yep. So it's a white ghost. Yeah. And so it's, it, I can't you know, it's stop very, playing this game. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very quick fire. It's very easy. Anyone can pick it up. Um, and I, I was interested in it because people, some of my friends were raving about it saying, oh, you have to play this game. It's so great. So yeah, I, so uh, I picked it up for 10 bucks. It's great. There's, um, I think Ghost Blitz adds the next layer to it. Or is Ghost Blitz the original? Ghost Blitz adds the next layer. So the next layer is there's the barrel where one of the objects is hidden. Yeah, that's the hat. Oh. Or the hat, yeah. Yep. So sometimes it's, um, you're looking at the cart and you can't see all the objects on the table. And it's just another level of trickiness. Because I had played the original game, I think it's just called Ghost. Yep. So I played Ghost um, a few years ago when we had people over. We were living in Uptown. Um, one of Spencer's friends brought it. Oh, I see. So you're saying that this was a game that existed before, and they yes. just like and kind of added, added another the layer. Blitz layer with ah. this hat. It looks like um, a fez. A fez. fez hat. Yeah. yeah. And so sometimes something is under the fez, and you can't. So you're looking at the table. Not just at the objects, but trying to remember what's not there. Right. And if it, it's the object that you can't see, you have to touch the hat, and it's tricky. Yeah. Well, and this is a different class of games as well. Some these are games that play so quickly that the rules, like you, do, you don't really need to play the game to learn the rules. If you just know the rules, you know the game. And so when you demo something like this, that demo is like, you know, a minute and a half. You run through, we draw a couple cards, you get the hang of it, and boom, you're done. Do you want to buy the game or not? Yep. And a lot of the kids' games and dexterity games are like this, where the demo is essentially this is how you do it, and then, okay. There's one basic yep. mechanic that you have to know, and once you know that, you're good to go. Yep. I noticed a lot of the dexterity games and um, kids' games will have jumbo versions for the demo, which is really fun to see these games blown up. Um, I know Junk Art was a really cool yep. one. They had a really big version Flick of that. Flick them up. Flick them up. They had that going like crazy. Those are really cool. Really draws the attention when you're wandering through the game hall to yep. well, see and, like this giant <laughs> and, set. And, like Mayfair will do like giant demos. So you're playing, um, you know, Giant Catan where you sign up for the slot and you know how to play Catan. You're just going to play on the big board. Right. And that's why you're signing up for it. So maybe you don't know, 
But anyway, um, I just thought the idea of demoing games as, as we were going through, it was, to me, it was an interesting way of learning games. It was an interesting way of like deciding if I want to play new games, I want to buy these games. And obviously at a show, that makes total sense. And that's just the question. It's like, can we pull that into our home? And I think we have shown that many games are actually doing that. They just kind of do it on the sly. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I honestly think if you kind of worked in some of those elements when you're teaching us, like maybe just instead of like going through all the walls, just like let's do one of those quick rounds and then reset. Um, I think that could really help. Well, at least I'm being selfish here because at least that's the best way that I learned. <laughs> <Yeah>. So. <laughs> Um, I do want to mention Deadline. We put it out on the table. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So Deadline is, um, I really like the way they demoed this because it is um, a secret information game. There's these, it has um, 12 cases. 12 mysteries, yeah. 12 mysteries that you solve. And it is, um, once you solve the mystery, you can't replay it. So they actually created a special demo case, which kind of made you want to sit and demo the game because that's the only time you're going to see that case when you buy the game it's not going to be a part of it so it's both an incentive to sit down and play like oh this is the only time you're going to see case zero um and also it doesn't spoil so you're not like oh i'm paying money for this game but i already played the first you know part of it why am i bothering it's like a secret for that expansion first. that you can never actually buy. You yep. can only play at a convention. Yep. Yeah. Well, and oftentimes when that happens, and it doesn't happen often, but if you go to Board Game Geek, you can usually go to the file section of a game and they may have like a print and play version of that particular case. I don't know in nice. this case. Um, that's that was no a lot pun of cases. Inten- <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but possibly it could be there as well. But I, I do agree with that. Like, there's these hidden games. And actually, we played Witch Hunt, and I don't think we can call that a demo. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, Deadline is the game that we were talking about. We haven't played it yet, but we bought this as our next couple's co-op now that we're done with Pandemic. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, Deadline. And then Witch Hunt, we did a – like I said, I don't know if it was a demo or not. We played the full game. But when you first played the first one, you know, he had to go through and explain all the different cards and all of that. There was no dry run there, but – I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm torn on whether or not that was a demo or yeah, if that was just a full game. It's tough because he does have uh, – that, that game does have a, a lot of extra roles in the box. So it could be that he had a slimmed down version of uh, – there's easier roles yeah. to use. Yeah, for, Witch Hunt, we were just playing the first Yeah, time. Witch Hunt is a variant of Werewolf. And we only played with, I think, 12 roles. And there's 22 in the box. And the number of games we played, we never really – we maybe added one or two other roles. So there's like 10 other roles that we've never touched. So that's why I say it's still kind of a stripped down. He didn't put the stuff that really requires advanced strategy or knowledge of the game in the in the games because we kept bringing in new players. Yeah, it's, it was an incredible game. It's, uh, it's totally better than Werewolf in my mind. So I'll be playing a lot more of that in the future. Yep. All right. I think we've talked this topic to death. So let's uh, go to our post topic. Um, I... Don't think we got any new iTunes reviews, but if we did, I will certainly mention them next week. <laughs> um, uh, Facebook and Twitter, we always would love to have you follow us there. So Twitter is at Tabletop Game TLK or at Game Master Chris if you want to follow me directly. Um, our Facebook is slash Tabletop Game Podcast. Um, if you want to help us out on Patreon, that would be tabletopgametalk.com slash Patreon. All of our patrons get entered into our contest for free. You don't have to do anything. If you back us, we'll take care of all of the entry stuff for you. And you'll get di- different um, different bonus entries depending on your level. <laughs> um, so I am also looking into our next goal. Actually, we've hit our um, game a-, a month goal. So that's why we are constantly giving away stuff, which makes it good to be a patron because you don't have to worry yeah. about it. You know, even if you didn't download any of the episodes, you're like, oh, I can only listen to one a month or something. Doesn't matter if you patron us, you're you're entered without without hesitation. Um and I think that's about it, unless you guys have anything to no? I don't think so no, today. So um I am interested our next topic is not technically tabletop but it's our next episode is going to drop on the 4th of july which is a u.s holiday we're worldwide i'm not going to assume everyone says the 4th of july is important to them um but in the u.s we have a lot of fireworks and a lot of picnics and outdoor stuff so we're going to 
base our topic around that. Um, and you'll have to listen for the next one minute to know what that topic is. <laughs> All right, Josh, take us out. Well, thank you for listening. And remember, we love your feedback. So consider leaving us an iTunes review. Email us with comments or questions at tabletopgametalk at gmail.com. Finally, a huge thank you to our patrons. Emil Jilljam, Shane Paul, George, Adam Harrison, Sam from New York, Tom Bly, Jason Strong, Terence Miltner, Stephen Seitz, Alex Brown, Michael Ohl, Josh Arns, Trevor Olson, Brian Arnold, Sean Kelly, Joseph Lee, John Merkel, Daniel Shepard, C. Marie, Rudy Rudy Lou, Benjamin Heimowitz, Jerry Huang, Mike Smith, Stephen Phillips, Caleb O'Brien, John Lewis, and Jennifer Engelbrecht. Until next week, when we talk about yard and picnic games, keep playing games and having fun. Good night. I think we could make a lawn darts version on the tabletop. So you can lose fingers as well as toes? Yeah. I like it. <laughs> <laughs>